from Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering AWS reInvent 2018. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services, Intel, and their ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Live coverage here in Las Vegas for Amazon reInvent 2018. Day three, we're winding down over 150 videos. We'll have over 500 clips. Losing the voice, Dave Vellante, my co-host. This is the analyst segment. We're going to extract the Cube Insights. James Kobelius, David Floyer from Wikibon. Jim, you've been prolific on the blog, siliconangle.com, great stories. David, you got some research. What's your take, Jim? You're all over what's going on in the news. What's the impact? I think that, that what this year's reInvent shows is that AWS is doubling down on AI. If you look at the sheer range of innovative AI capabilities they've introduced into their portfolio in terms of their announcements, it's, um, it's really significant. A, they have optimized TensorFlow for their cloud. B, they now have an automated labeling, called ground truth labeling capability that leverages Mechanical Turk, which has been an Amazon uh, capability for a while. They've also got um, now the, the industry's first, what's called reinforcement learning plugin to their, Sage, to their data science tool chain, in this case SageMaker. Reinforcement learning is becoming so important for robotics and gaming and lots of other applications of AI. And I'm just scratching the surface. So uh, there's, they've announced a lot of things and David can discuss you know, other things. But I'm seeing the depth of AI, uh, their investment in it, uh, shows that they've really got their fingers on what enterprises are doing and will be doing to differentiate themselves with this technology over the next you know, five to 10 years. What's an area that you see that people are getting clearly AI what areas are people missing that are, that's compelling that you've observed here? When you say people are missing, you mean the general? Journalists, uh, oh. audience, there's so much news. Yeah, yeah. Where are the nuggets that are in, hidden in all the, in the news? <laughs> what are you seeing that people might not see that, that's different? Um, getting back to the point I was raising, which is that robotics is becoming a predominant application realm for AI. Robotics. It, for, you know, outside the laboratory or outside of industrial IOT. I mean, robots are coming into everything and there's a, there's a way, there's, there's a special type of AI you build into robots. Reinforcement learning is a big part of it. Um, so I think the general, if you look at the journalists, you know, the journalists, they've missed the fact that I've seen in the past couple of years, robotics and reinforcement learning have become, are almost on the verge of being mainstream in this space. And AWS gets it. I mean, just the depth of their, of their investments, like Deep Racer, that cute little autonomous vehicle, they've been, you know, uh, 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 you know they, have, they, they, they rolled out here at this event. That just shows that they totally get it. That, that's a huge, that will be a huge growth sector. David Floyer, Outpost is their on-premises cloud. You've been calling this for I don't know how many years. <laughs> Three years. Three years. Yeah. What's the and people said, no way, Floyer's wrong. <laughs> yeah. okay, so you get vindication. <laughs> but people in particular in AWS. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're right, okay, so you're right. But what, it's going to be out in a year. Yeah, next Will this thing actually make it to the market? And if it does, what is the impact? Who wins and who loses? Well, let's start with, uh, will it get to the market? Absolutely. Um, it is uh, it, Outpost, AWS Outpost is the name. It is taking AWS in the cloud and putting it on premise. The same APIs, the same uh, services. It's, it's, it'll be eventually identical between the two. Uh, and that has enormous increase in the range and the reach that AWS and the TAM that AWS can go after. It is a major, major impact on the marketplace. Puts pressure on a whole number of people, uh, the, the traditional vendors who are, are supplying that marketplace at the moment. And uh, in my opinion, it's going to be wildly successful. Uh, yeah. this, people have been waiting that, wanting that, particularly in the enterprise market. The, the reasons for it are simple. Latency, low latency, you've got to have the data and the compute very close together. Uh, you, you, moving data is very, very expensive over long distances. And the third one is many people want or need to have the data in certain places. So the combination is meeting the requirements 
Uh, they've taken a long time to get there. I think it's going to be, however, wildly successful. It's, it's going to be coming out in 2019. They'll have their alpha, their betas in the beginning of it. They'll have some announcements probably about mid-2019. Uh, who's, th who's, who's threatened by this? Everybody, Cisco, HP, Dell. Um... The integration of everything, storage, networking, uh, compute, all in the same box, is obviously a threat to, to all suppliers within that. And they're going to have to adapt to that uh, pretty strongly. It's going to be a declining market. Declining markets are good if you if uh, adapt properly. Uh, a lot of people make a lot of money from, uh, like IBM, from mainframes. You're, you're playing it safe, IBM. not naming names. Okay, next <laughs> point, I'll rephrase. What's your prediction? What's my prediction uh, on? Of the landscape after this is wildly successful. The landscape is that the alternatives is going to be a much, much smaller pie, and only those that have volume, and only those that can uh, adapt to that environment are going to survive. Well, and let's, let's name names. So, who's threatened by this? Clearly Dell, EMC is threatened by this. HP. uh, HPE, uh, Nutanix, you know, the, 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 the VX rack guys, you know, Lenovo's in there. Uh, are they wiped out? No, but they have to respond. They have How to do respond. they respond? Yeah. They have to have self-service. They have to have utility pricing. They, they have to connect to the cloud. So either they go hard after AWS, you know, connecting to AWS, or they belly up to, to Microsoft with Microsoft Azure Stack. With Azure. That's yeah. clearly going to be yeah. you know, their fallback mm. place. So, so in a way, Microsoft with Azure Stack is also threatened by this, but in a way it's goodness for well, them because think, yeah. the ecosystem's going to evolve to that. So listen, these guys don't just give up. I mean, they're they're no. hard competitors, no, they're no. fighters. It's, it's also, to me, a, 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 a confirmation of Oracle's same, same strategy. On paper, Oracle's got that, got that down, they're executing on that even though it's in a narrow Oracle world. So I think it does sort of indicate that that iPhone for the enterprise strategy is actually quite viable. If I may, if I may jump in here, four things stood out to me. The satellite as a service was to me amazing. What's next? I mean, Amazon with scale, there's just so many opportunities for them. The edge, I'd love, if we have time, I'd love to talk about the talk edge. About the edge. The yeah. hybrid evolution and open source. Amazon used to make it easy for the enterprise players to compete. They had limited sales and service capabilities. They had no open source give back. They were hybrid deniers. Everything's <laughs> going to go into the public cloud. That's all changed. They're making it much, much more difficult for the, what they call the old guard to compete. So they're taking away the objection. Yeah, they're removing those barriers, those okay. objections. Awesome. Yeah. And the, to, to, to come in on one of the things you're talking about, which is the edge, they have completely changed their approach to the edge. Yeah. Uh, they have put in Neo as part of SageMaker, yeah. which allows them to push out inference code, and, and they themselves are pointing out that inference code is 90% of all the compute into yeah, all not sorts the training. of not the training, yeah. that the inference code after that, that's 90% of the compute, they're pushing that into to the devices at the edge, all sorts of architectures. That's a major shift uh, in yeah. uh, mindset yeah, about agree. that. And in fact, um, I was really impressed by Elastic Inference for the same reasons, because it very much is a validation of a trend I've been seeing in the AI space for the last several years, which is you can increasingly build AI in your preferred visual, declarative environment with Python code, and then the abstraction layers of the AI ecosystem have developed to the point where the ecosystem increasingly will auto-compile to TensorFlow or MXNet or PyTorch, and then from, from there, further auto-compile your, your deployed, trained model to the most efficient format for the edge device, for the GPU or whatever, wherever it's going to be executed. That's already a well-established trend the fact that AWS has productized that with this elastic inference in their cloud shows that not only do they get that trend, they're, gonna, they're just going to push really hard on making sure that AWS, it, it becomes in many ways the hub of efficient inferencing for everybody. One more quick point on the edge, if I may. It reminds me, what's going on on the edge reminds me of the days when Microsoft was trying to take Windows and stick it on mobile, right, the Windows phone top-down IT guys coming at it, and, right, and that's what right. a lot of people are doing today in IT, it's not going to work. What Amazon is doing is say, we're going to build 
an environment that you can produce app, build applications on that are secure, you can manage them from a bottoms up approach, identifying yeah. what the operations Absolutely. technology developers want, giving them the tools to do that, that's a winning strategy. And, and, and focusing on them producing the devices, not themselves, right. and, and not declaring where the, where the boundaries are. Spot on. Very, right. very important. Yep. And the, obviously, inferencing is, you get most value out of the data if you put that inferencing as close as you possibly can to that data, which, oh, and, which me, within, within a camera is in the camera itself. And I alluded to it earlier, another key announcement from AWS here is, First of all, the investment in SageMaker itself is super impressive. In the, in the years since they introduced it, look at they've already added, I mean, they, they had that slide with all the feature enhancements and new modules they've added. Uh, SageMaker Ground Truth, re really important, the fully managed service for automating labeling of training data sets using mechanical circuitry. I mean, the vast majority of the, uh, of what, uh, the cost in a lot of AI initiatives involves human annotators of training data, and without human annotated training data, you can't do supervised learning, which is the magic underlying a lot of AI. AWS gets the fact that they have to auto, that their customers want to automate that to the nth degree. Now they got that. We sound like fanboys. That's be wildly popular. As we say, clean data makes good ML, and good ML makes great AI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want any dirty data out there. Yeah. Cube, more coverage here. Cube Insights panel here in theCUBE at reInvent. Stay with us for more after this short break.